I'm very pleased and honored to be here this evening. Uh, yes, uh, I have a connection with Greece uh, through my mother and my father, uh, who uh, came from who come who come from Epirus, uh, the area where where Agrafa, some of the Agrafa are, and the the, the Pindas really. Um, but it's an area that I learned about uh, on the banks of the Susquehanna River in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, where I was born back in 1932. And in growing up, hearing my mother, who had come over to the United States as a young bride in 1931, uh, with no English, of course, so Greek was what we spoke at home, until I was, in fact, when I went off to school, I couldn't speak any English. Uh, but not, not only was it the Greek language, but it was the songs. And as a boy, uh, it was the songs that I really remembered and took with me all of my life. And I, it, there, were, there were songs that I just couldn't get out of my mind. And I kept telling myself, someday I've got to write these songs down. And I said, man, I got to see me. Someday we, we got to get together. Well, she was 95 when we finally got together to do this. And from 95 to the age of 100, uh, she told me, retold me these songs, they poured out of her. I expected five or ten, there were hundreds that she remembered. And she was an example of that oral tradition that existed in Greece, certainly until the beginning of the Second World War. It wasn't only unique to Epirus, uh, one would have found it in the islands, one would have found it everywhere. Uh, and these songs were not folklore then. These were songs that were an intimate, integral part of their everyday life. As my mother said, the songs were our life. Uh, we worked with songs. We, we, we danced with songs. We cried with songs. Uh, songs really marked our, our lives. Um, and it was these songs then that uh, she and I sat down, and I began writing them down, and I thought, what, what am I going to do with these songs? I mean, after I had about 100 or so. And I thought, well, in the diaspora now, in the United States, Canada, Australia, there is a, an Anglophone Greek diaspora. It's, not, it's no longer really a Greekophone, Hellenophone diaspora. Very few of the second, third, fourth generation, understandably enough, don't speak, English, don't speak Greek. So I thought it was important that we get these songs down, and I was going to try to translate them. And I, I'm not sure that I succeeded in, in doing a good job in the translations, but I hope that uh, at least they convey some of the, 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 the passion, the poetry, the, 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 the imagination of these people. Uh, as, as John said, these people live lived life at the, at the edge. Uh, uh, there, was, there was no electricity, there were no radios, there were no books. Uh, they were living really on a day-to-day -day basis with the reality of, 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 the, of the nature that they were, of the beautiful nature they were living in, but also of the life that was hard. Um, and particularly this village, this village of Theodoria, you know, where my parents came from, um, it's up in the, in the Tzumerka. Uh, the Tzumerka, uh, are part of the Pindus. The word itself, Zumerka, is a Slavic word, and it means hellebore, uh, which uh, uh, I think in Greek is elivoro, eliboros, which is the ancient Greeks use it as a poison, uh, and it grows all over that mountain. Um, today, the, the, the villagers use it as a, um, as a uh, when, when they have a toothache. Uh, they, they usually uh, take the sap from the hellebore and put it in their mouth to, to sort of numb the pain. But in any event, this village is the highest uh, village uh, in the in the in the Tumerica, um, and it's called Theodoriana. Um, it's it's it must be a very old village because we do know from classical times there was a, there was a, a city there called Theodoria. Um, Theodoria that means the fields belonging to the Theodoria. So presumably. Theodoria must have been somewhere in the city. We don't know where it was. But in any case, that's where they were from. And uh, uh, the, the village itself was very isolated. Uh, and in fact, during the Second World War, uh, Zerbas, who, who, who was a leader of one of the 
uh, 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 resistance forces uh, had his headquarters there. And the thought was that the Germans would never get there. Well, they did. They, 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 they literally got up there with tanks, burned about half the village down. And my, one of my, sis, my, my, my little sisters was killed at that time. Um, but until 1940, this village was pretty isolated. And the villagers would come down from uh, on October the 26th. They would take their sheep and come down to the lowlands of the Himalaya. Um, and mostly, about half the village. The village would make about 3,000 people. It was called Kefalochori, which meant it was an important village. Um, so half the village would come down during the winter time with their sheep or to try to find work, picking olives, picking oranges, or whatever, um, uh, building. They're also builders. Um, the other half, the old, the old people, the children would stay back in the village itself um, so that the, the life of the village continued. There was no break in that tradition that went back hundreds of years without any break at all until 1940. Um, and that's why, why these songs are also so important because until that time, as I said, the, 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 the life of the village had, was, 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 a, was a continuous link with the past. It had, there had been no breaks at all. With the coming of the Second World War, uh, they, as I said, the Germans bombed the village, then the Civil War. The result was that the villagers, many of them fled, came down to the mainland, came down to the lowlands, so that today, if you go to the village, in the wintertime, there's no one there practically, three or four people. Uh, and there are about 500 houses in this village. It's not, it's not a small village, it's 500 houses, well-built houses. Um, and uh, in the summertime, many of the people come back uh, to the village, but this was a village that was alive in the wintertime and in the summertime. Uh, that's no longer the case. These songs, however, and, 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 and the stories that, my mother, that I have written in the book go back to a time when the, this, the life of the village was unbroken uh, and, and continue without any kind of, 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 of uh, uh, break in, in these traditions. Um, and uh, even uh, at, at growing up as she did in this village, uh, the life was very, very, life was very, very difficult for them, particularly for the women. Um, women did a lot of the hard work in these villages, uh, from uh, going out and, and, and doing the, uh, the hoeing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the fields, uh, bringing the wood back, uh, cutting wood, bringing it back on their backs, going for water. Um, the, men, the men were taking care of the sheep, and that was in the, in the, in the flocks, and that in itself was also very, 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 very difficult, to say the least, and hard. But the women, the women uh, were the ones who really kept the village going, particularly because many of the men, the men folk would be, would be gone, particularly during the winter time. Uh, so that the, the result was that the, the life uh, depended, depended on these women. And these songs also, uh, you know, uh, you, can, you can see and hear in the, in the, in the, in the, in the songs this kind of, this kind of a, a lifestyle. Um, and I, uh, in terms of uh, uh, where we are, it, it, uh, it, it, as far as my mother was concerned, she, she wanted to be a teacher. But unfortunately, she only got to the, sec the second grade. Uh, not because uh, she wasn't bright enough, but simply because the family was putting all of its emphasis on her, on her brother. And this is what they did uh, in those days. So that my mother did not get a chance to to uh, complete or anything more than <clears throat> really the second, she, she, she skipped the first grade. It was put in the second grade and finished the, uh, the third grade. Um, and um, I want to read you a, 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 little, a little poem that she wrote uh, when she was, um, when she was in her nine, almost 101. Um, where she, let's see if I can find it in here. Um, I can see her in here. Ah. <clears throat> when I first started school, a girl child of six, for me, my mother embroidered a pretty little handbag. 
where I could put my book, the only one I had, as well as a tablet, pencil, and piece of slate. Oh, how all were dearly bought. Whoa, if one of them you lost. That first day of school, a girl child of six, I thought I had the whole world in my embroidered little handbag. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> well, as I said, unfortunately, she was not able to finish her schooling because what happened was, and it's a sad story, and it's a story that I heard her actually repeat to herself the day she died. She was, it was May, and she was sitting there and she was trying to figure out how to write Maios. And Maios in Greek has a diarosis, alpha, and the yota has the little two dots over the top. And she was sitting there and she uh, was asking her father. And her father, incidentally, had doted on her as a child. In fact, he had prepared her to get into the first grade body, but when she started the first grade, she already knew how to read, write, and, and do, the, do, do her sum. So she was promoted, she went right into the second grade. So anyway, anyway, her father was sitting there and she was telling her, out came her grandfather, who also loved her very much. And um, he was, had just come out of his nap, the afternoon nap, and he wanted his cup of coffee. And um, he said something, and of course, my mother was busy with that, and he started muttering about giving girls an education or whatever, you know, the the chalas and the korichimas, you know, sort of blah, 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 blah. He was, he wasn't, he, he was not a bad man, but he was just muttering away, as, as old men do. But my, 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 his son, my grandfather, apparently got upset or whatever, and tore my mother's book. And my mother was absolutely, absolutely stunned and shamed. And shame, as you know, Doropi played a very important role and still does in Greek culture, at least in some parts of Greek culture. So Doropiastik, my mother was shamed. And she refused to go to school. She, she, wouldn't go, she was too ashamed to go back to school and she never went back to school again. But she remembered that and she held that in her heart and held it against her mother, her, her, her grandfather and her father, and I heard her, she was sitting there, uh, as I said, the last day she died, and she was muttering to herself, sitting in the corner, and I was in another room, and I heard her say, I can't forgive them, and I, I've sinned, God, I've sinned. So, it was something that she could never put away in her, from her, that she never got the education that she wanted. So, of course, she wanted us, my brother, my sister, and me to have the education. And we did get the education, thanks to my mother and father. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the thing is that, uh, as far as, as, as uh, the uh, village, again, to go back to the village, um, you have to also understand that uh, during the, the Turkish times, this, these villages up in the mountains of Epirus and at Mani, there were certain areas of Greece that were never really <coughs> occupied by the, by, the, uh, by the Ottomans. In fact, the Ottomans didn't really want to bother with them. They were so up and uh, they considered them not really worth, it, the, worth, worth the trouble. But they also became refuges for uh, people who did not want to live under the Turkish yoke, if you will. Um, and certainly, in time, they became uh, the haunts of um, uh, renegades, bandits, and whatever. Um, and as time went on during the, the, the 18th the 19th century, and with the, um, with, the, with the breakdown of law and order in the Ottoman Empire in its latter days, these people became uh, known as klefti. Well, uh, it depended on who who you were, what side you were on. Um, in time, these, these clefts uh, also, in effect, became freedom fighters, if you will, because what, what was also going on in Greece in the, uh, in the latter part of the uh, 18th century was the coming into Greece of modern ideas, uh, one of which, of course, was nationalism, and further, further intensified after the French Revolution, so that you had, you had these clefts Initially, kind of brigands, whatever, not wanting to be under the Turkish under Turkish rule, whatever. 
but becoming imbued in time with feelings of being of, uh, of, of nationalism. Now, keeping in mind that the Greeks never had lost even even the ones who were down in the, in the, in the lowlands, I mean, they never lost their idea of being a Greek and their language. Uh, but the, the modern sense of nationalism really became intensified at, in the latter part of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. And so these clefts, in time, it became much more of a of a nationalistic, if you will, and I'm using the word in a very, very loose way at this time, but in any event, there was, there was a very strong sense that they were fighting uh, against an oppressor, against a, a Turkish oppressor. And these songs, um, there were songs and they came out of that tradition, the kleftic, the, the kleft songs, the kleftica, uh, which uh, were uh, uh, in many ways war songs, if you will, um, and which my mother uh, remembered very well because, uh, again, until my mother left, this tradition of, of, the, of remembering these songs was very, very strong in the village. And um, I could read you, uh, I would like to read you just a little bit of one of these cleft songs. Um, it gives you an idea of, um, of what, what, what the clefts um, were like. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, okay, the life of a cleft. Since you want gallantry, my boys, and to become like clefts, ask me, and I will tell you how those clefts pass their days. For some years I was a captain among those bands of clefts, and all that time I did not sleep on a mattress or a pillow. My hand was pillow for my head, and my sword was my mattress. And at night, with my dear musket, I had to stand alone on guard. So this is a kind of a, you know, a kind of a, a war, you might say, a, a warrior remembering his, his time as, 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 a, as a fighter um, uh, against, the, uh, against the Turk. Um, but one of the most famous of the, of the songs that also sort of shows to, to some extent what happens, and I'm sure some of you may have heard of it, Kitsu's mother, so it's Kitsu's mother sitting there, down by the river's edge, and at the river she did toil, she did rail, and pelted it with stones. O oh, river, lessen now your flow, O oh, river, backward turn, so over yonder I can cross eclectic villages to reach, where clefts are all now gathering in festival and feast. For Kitsu they have captured him, and going off to hang him, a thousand Albanians in the front, two thousand in the rear, and in their midst my Kitsu walks, his hands well bound and tied, like an apple, like a rose, like a little lass from Patras. His mother then called out to him, his mother then does ask him, Where have you, Kitsu, put your arms? Where have you put your musket? You don't weep, mother, that I'm young, nor weep that I'm brave and handsome, but only ask about my arms and my forsaken musket. I abandoned them, dear mother, at the plane tree in the roots. This is a very famous song, and it's a song that my mother used to sing a lot, to Kitsui Mara Katete, as in Greek. Um, the, the life, as I said, in the village consisted of coming down in October to the Himaria, and then uh, October 26th usually would be the day that they would leave, and they would come back up uh, on St. George's Day on the 23rd of April to come back up to the village. Um, and um, as my mother used to say that life in the village of those days was something like the Wild West. It was, it was rough living in the villages in those days. Um, there, was, there was still brigandage and, and, and uh, cattle rustling or sheep rustling going on. Um, and um, uh, people were being kidnapped for, for ransom. My grandfather, my great grandfather, uh, who um, uh, was considered to be one of the prominent men of the, men of the village, particularly because he spoke Turkish. And one of his duties was to help gather the, the kharazi, the, 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 the uh, uh, tax that had to be taken down once a year to, the, um, to, to Arta, which is the provincial capital, um, to uh, pay off their, their, their annual tax. And because he was, in effect, in charge of that, he was not the tax collector. I mean, he was not a tax collector, but he was responsible. And if he, if he and the others in the, in the, 
and the, the, the council uh, did not uh, uh, come up with the, the exact amount, then they were in trouble. But because he had that, that, that role, uh, it was thought that he had money. And so uh, one afternoon, he was kidnapped by a band of these um, brigands. Now, these were not clefts by this time. These were just ordinary brigands. And they held him for, um, for, um, for hostage and threatened to kill him um, if they um, didn't get, um, I forget, I think it was something like 60 pieces of gold and a couple of gold watches and that sort of thing. But this, this happened about 1870, roughly, I'm guessing between 1865 in 1870, and um, <clears throat> he was able, they were able to save him eventually because um, the village all, all chipped in and helped, helped them get the, the ransom together, and he was saved. As a result, however, he was not able to finish um, building his house, and it had to be finished then later by two of his sons who went off to the United, to America, uh, to, um, to try to make their fortune, and they sent the money back to help finish the house. But uh, I want to read you uh, a short poem uh, that comes from that time that describes the kidnapping of uh, one of the daughters of Averov. I'm sure you know the name Averov. Um, it's a very, very prominent name. They come from, uh, they come from the village, village on the other side, uh, from um, um, Metzovo. And uh, this, um, this describes pretty much um, let's see if I, hope I can find it here. Um, a, a similar, a similar, um, a similar situation where um, the daughter was was kidnapped for a ransom. If I can find it. Oh, here it is. Um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, I wanted to mention it earlier. I wish you were coming in. Uh, you were you were hearing music that was being played. It's on a CD that my mother also was able to inspire and participate in with um, uh, Lakis Chalkias. And Lakis Chalkias, um, you may have known him, some of you may know him, know him. He's, he's, he tends to sing popular music, but he, he comes out of a tradition of Dimoticat Raudia. His father, Tasso Chalkias, was one of the great clarinet players of, of Greek Avipirot music. In fact, he was so good, the father that is, that in the 40s he was in New York and, and um, Benny Goodman heard him and was just absolutely amazed by, by his playing. And this, this family of Charkiades uh, were professional musicians who used to go from village to village, particularly in Ipiros and perhaps in some other parts, but certainly in Ipiros, and my mother remembered these people coming to the village back in 1918, 1919, when she was just a girl. And I, and I grew up hearing her talk about Chalkiades, Chalkiades, you know. And I come to Athens, and I meet Lakis Chalkiades, and it turns out that his, his grandfather and my mother, I mean, my mother had danced to his grandfather's music in the village. So he was, he was, a, he was thrilled, he wanted to meet my mother, they met, and they did a CD. Um, which um, I have here, in fact, and you can, if you're interested, and I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any copy, but you can, you can get the CD, and it's music that that Lakis uh, and songs that are from this book, um, and one of the songs from the book is this song, is this song that I'm going to read to you now, describing um, what happened to. Uh, one of the Averov girls who was kidnapped back in, as I recall, I have it here, it says when? Kidnapped in, um, in on February, uh, July 31st, 1884. Okay. <coughs> Keep in mind now, Metzov at that time was still under the Turks, 1884. That Metzov did, uh, did not get its freedom until uh, 1912. So, and this, and this song is on the CD. Isn't it a pity and unjust and even more a sin that Basilo, that's the girl's name, Basilo's in a wilderness in lonely banded hideouts and makes her bed from reeds and brush and her pillows from a beech tree. The leader of the gang called out and the leader speaks and tells her, get up Basilo, dawn has come, get up, it's already day, get up and make your coffee now and have a dry piece of bread. They have brought us, they brought to us the ransom 
loaded well upon three mules, all silver coins and gold florins, and bags all filled with pearls. They had to pay a huge ransom to, 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 uh, to save her life. <clears throat> and the man, the man who did it, um, we know his name. I have it written here in one of my footnotes. Um, in any event, he escaped, dressed as a woman, ended up in Zemirna, and we know that he was killed in 1921 fighting the Turks uh, during, the, uh, during the, the, the last days of uh, the, the uh, Asia Minor uh, uh, tragedy. Um, but again, uh, this song uh, describes the life uh, back in the early 19th century uh, in these mountains was really uh, pretty rough. Uh, and very unpredictable. Uh, and it, it didn't matter sometimes um, whether you were uh, uh, rich or poor. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was really rough. Uh, now, the, um, going on now in terms of um, uh, going in terms of where um, they my mother came to, as I said, came to the United States in, 19, in 1931, um, 1930. My father had seen her picture. Um, he was, at that time, he was in Hagerstown, Maryland, um, where, where he was in partnership with, a fam with family members of, of, of her family. And he, he, he saw her picture and was smitten with her. And in 1930, um, that was the 100th anniversary of the Greek Republic's establishment. At that point in time, Greece was a republic in 1930, uh, between being a monarchy and being, then being a monarchy again. Venizelos was, as I recall, a prime minister in 1930. And Greece was celebrating its 100th anniversary. And as part of the celebrations, uh, a huge delegation came from the United States uh, under the uh, auspices of a HEPA. I don't know if any of you know what a HEPA is, the American Hellenic Educational Progressive Association. And it was founded in Atlanta, Georgia, back in the 20s. My father was one of the founding members, not in Atlanta, but earlier when it was founded, uh, established in the North. Um, founded because, in part, a discrimination against Greeks uh, in the South. Um, and in 1930, uh, they had this huge um, celebration um, and uh, my father was a member of the, of the group that came over to celebrate. But they also were not coming, many of them were, were coming not only to celebrate, but to get married. Um, and if you've seen, there was a movie made called Nephis, if any of you saw it, uh, that describes in part some of the, some of what, what happened. I think well, my mother was not necessarily one of those specific brides, uh, because my father um, knew the family. But my father had been missing, had been absent from his village for 30 years. My father left the village at the age of 12. Uh, his mother had died. Uh, his father uh, had remarried. Uh, apparently, uh, according to my, my father's memory, uh, memories, very uh, uh, unpleasant stepmother who kept him clean, but also uh, was not very, very uh, uh, gentle with him. So by the age of 12, my father wanted to leave, and he asked his father, they, I'm leaving, and his father said, fine, you have my blessing, and uh, uh, you should go to Athens and find some work uh, with, uh, one of your, uh, with one of my cousins. He gets to Athens, um, and the cousin's wife doesn't want the Spsidas Meno Choriati in her house, this uh, lousy villager in her house. And so she puts him out. In the Hayati, uh, this is February about 1901. My father was born in 1989. Um, and my dad, as a result, realized he was not wanted. That's a 12 year old kid now, keep in mind. Um, and decided he was going to go out on his own. Athens at that time can, was uh, up to what is now Sindarma, beyond Sindarma. It was uh, Ekali. It was just open countryside. It was the, the couple of four or five, six big mansions. Um, Athens was Psidi and Plaka, and that's where that's where Athens was. So my dad 
So all these boys were selling newspapers, and he figured that's what he's going to do. So he tried to get newspapers, they gave him newspapers, but every little boy had his stake, he had this little corner, and the next thing you know, he was pushed out, and he was outside of Athens. He was up in what is now Vasilis of Sophia's, uh, where there was nothing, nothing except these big mansions, and nobody was going by, and so um, he got really uh, worried that nobody was going to buy his car, his uh, newspapers. So he said, well, I'll just knock on the doors. So he began knocking on the doors of these mansions and being pushed away because they thinking that he was a beggar. And he finally ended up in front of one of these houses and knocked on the door. And the woman came out and <clears throat> was pushing him away. Uh, he couldn't understand because she, she wasn't speaking Greek. And this very elegant man came out and said, Tifan is beating him what, 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 what is it you want? And my father said, well, now I'm committed to this. Then he went to see Janos. I'm selling, I'm not, I'm not a beggar, I'm selling newspapers. And the man said, uh, Apopoulisse, where are you from? Hippos. Ah, Hippos, 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 Dobros. He'd be working, you know, a good guy. I said, well, in the So he said, all right, bring them. Well, they brought him in. The house today is the Benaki Museum, and my, the man's name was Harokopos. Harokopos, you may, some of you may know, he was a very uh, wealthy man who made his money in, in Romania. He and his brothers, they've endowed various, uh, various institutions. There's the Harokopia in Scholia, in, um, I think it's in Laris, I think, or Lamia. I forget where it is, any of them. But my father ended up in, the, in, his, in this house working as a Naran boy for a couple of years. But in the meantime, he got it in his, in his head, he, wanted to, be, he wanted, wanted to go to sea. He loved the sea and he wanted to go to sea. And he, luckily for him, in 1906 or seven, uh, the minister of the, of the Navy was a man named um, uh, Calapanos, who was from Arta, a very, very wealthy man, and um, as I said, minister of the Navy. And so my dad got into his head at the age of 14 that he was going to present himself to Harakal, to uh, Carapanos and get himself appointed as a cadet to the naval school at Poros, which he did. He got himself into the office telling them that he was a, a baptistico, which of course so it's a very, very easy thing to believe as the politicians used to go around baptizing everybody. And, and when my father told him his last name, he knew my father's last name because the family was a fairly well-known family in, in the village. Uh, voting family, so they said, well, what do you want? He said, I, tell him, I want you to put me in the school of Poros. He said, but you're a blajo, you know, you're not going to go, you're not a seaman. He said, I, that's where I want to go to school. And he ended up at Poros, at the school, and he stayed in that school for six years. He spent all of his, his teenage years in that school, the happiest years of his life, um, and he never, never forgot. And in fact, he used to show me in you know, his, his, on his leg, the scars from playing football. I said, we were among the first football team in Greece. You don't play football in this country. The real football is what we played. And he would show me the scars on his leg from the football. Um, and um, in 1910, um, he, there was a change in government, so his patron was no longer there. And he decided to go off to England. By this time, he's in, he was 20. And he was in England for a couple of years, and the, 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 war in 19, the Balkan War started. And he voluntarily came back, and he served on the Spendoni, which was a, a destroyer, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> particip participated in the um, in the liberation of Thessaloniki. He was in Thessaloniki on to Iudimitri when the city was uh, liberated. He was very very proud of that that he had managed to be there that day. He was also there the day that that, that King George was assassinated. Uh, in fact, they had just seen him, maybe, he would tell me, they had just seen him maybe about an hour before the, the, the king was assassinated. In any case, at the end of the 1914, the war was over, the wars were over, he was honorably discharged, he went back to England, and he was on a ship sailing to Canada when the war started, the First World War started. He was, was, was with, with a friend of his from Kalimnus, you, you remember, and um, they decided they were, they were not going to die for the British. Uh, they, he did not like the British very much for some reason. I don't know why. Um, well, I do know why. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, <laughs> I won't go into that. Uh, um, and um, so he 
eventually ended up on the Great Lakes in the United States, sailing in American ships, became an American citizen by, as a result of uh, being in a, um, in a merchant, uh, as a merchant seaman in the United States in 1921. And that's how he ended up in Maryland, where he was working with um, these uh, people from uh, the Jorio, his village, they, they had met up again after all these years, and they said, you've got to come back, you're 30 years, you haven't been back, you must come back to the village, and look at the girls that we have in the village, and they showed him a picture of my mother, and ah! And so the rest was history. He goes back, they get married in 1930, and uh, my mother comes to the United States uh, in 1931. Uh, she was pregnant then, and uh, she lost a child, actually, as she came into, uh, into New York Harbor, uh, and uh, she almost, uh, she almost, they almost were not going to allow her in uh, because of the fact that she had lost the child. But because my father was an American citizen and, a citizen and served in the in the uh, during the war, she was okay. But in any event, she got in, and they ended up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Finally, that's where I was born, and that's where I grew up, and. Uh, we were very lucky in Harrisburg uh, in the sense that, well, there were two things we were very lucky about. First of all, um, we had, uh, it was a, a very, very uh, small city, but it was a real city. It was the capital. And um, we had an excellent uh, high, uh, educational system. I mean, it, it, the, the American public school systems in the 30s, at least in Pennsylvania, were, were excellent. Um, and. Uh, and it was, it, we had, it was, as I said, a real city. It was a symphony orchestra, libraries. It was, I mean, I never felt that I grew up in a small hick town, you know, but I never got that. And at the same time, we had a very strong, small Greek community. We had a church. We had about 150, 200 uh, 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 families, uh, mostly from Arcadia. We were, I think, we were the only Ipiroz. Uh, some from Ipiroz, from Asia Minor, but mostly from Arcadia. Um, but we were very, very close to the uh, community, and we were very lucky in having also a very good Greek teacher, Kirit Sivimingra, God bless her, wherever she is, who was a graduate of the Arsakion. And that was something, in those days, to be a graduate of the Arsakion was something. And also, many of the graduates of the Arsakion were also poor girls, too. Um, and they, uh, or uh, in this case, they were, she was a daughter, or a daughter of a priest, as I remember. But the wonderful thing about her was that, um, and I keep in mind, first of all, you know, we went to Greek school after American school, which meant that Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, uh, we were in school. I mean, from, you know, from till 3 o'clock, and then we'd come home, and then we'd have to go to Greek school until 7, 30, 8 o'clock. And many of us did not really like that. I mean, we wanted to go out and play, or we wanted to, you know, do other things. Um, but. One of the reasons we, we ended up going was because of Kiritsi um, Limingra. Mondays we had um, Ramadiki, and Wednesdays we had Historia, and Friday we had Triskeptika, uh, really uh, the catechism. But after those lessons were over, she would regale us with stories from the Iliad and the Odyssey. And she would tell them in a way, and I can still see her, she was a rather, a rather, uh, Full. I mean, she was almost real and big and full of herself, but she would just, just inundate us with words, as beautiful words and images. And, and she, she started from the very beginning. She worked all the way through the other. I mean, I can remember her describing when Priam came, you know, to beg Achilles for, for, his, for, for his son. She has weeping, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and, and then, or, or when, 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 uh, when, uh, well, the Isaiah took out the eye of the of, of Polyphemus, and uh, I mean, I, mean I, I can remember these stories in, and in Greek. Now, this was not, of course, not in ancient Greek, but it could have been. I mean, it, it was, it was, it was. I'm sure this is the way the Olympians were told two thousand years ago, uh, in the same same manner. And that's one reason why we would, I think, that many of us kept going because we wanted to, to sort of find out what happened next. And Kiritsi Mingla would sort of keep us, she would always stop the story just at the time where it to, to, sort of to get us to, 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 to come back into the story again. Um, <clears throat> so that um, uh, growing up in Harrisburg, uh, it was as if in many ways, and I'm sure this is true of many people who live in diasporas, whether it's a Greek diaspora or whatever, 
you're, you're, you're living almost in two worlds, and when it would become really intense for us was during Holy Week. Um, we, would, we would go to church every night, and we would be in church all the way through to the end of the service. I mean, and nothing that goes on here in Greece. I, I mean, I, I, I Pascha, the, the, uh, the, 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 the services, as a growing up, I, and not only I, but all of us, we were in these churches for, for hours, hours and hours. Um, and we were fasting, too. Uh, I mean, I can't say, I, I do remember as a young boy, that